Is it on? Am I on? Okay, good. Uh oh. We got a songbook up here. Is it, is, does somebody want me to sing? Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everyone. So we have a bunch of people still at CMO. Uh, I, I believe they're in their last session right now in the morning, and then they'll be making their travel back. And so we want to make sure that we are lifting them up in prayer and praying that God uh, spoke to them in a mighty way. Uh, I always love retreats. I love conferences. Uh, God always seems to speak. Why do you think that is? Anybody just want to care to guess? Why do you think that is? Mark? You're not listening most of the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, he's a bro. Hey. Hey. All right. I'm going to talk to Jesus about you. Um, no, I think, here's what I think. I think it's because you get yourself out of the norm, right? Different surroundings, and it, it just kind of, it kind of causes you to think differently maybe a little bit uh, or see other perspectives. And so it's always good to retreat. You know, Jesus did that. Um, it says that he often withdrew about a stone's cast to be with the Lord, with his Father. And so I encourage you all uh, to, uh, to, to have times when you are alone with the Father and times where you get away from your normal surroundings to, uh, to just uh, hear from the Lord, see what he has to say to you. Happy Fourth. Happy Fourth. How many of you celebrated? You went to fireworks? You went and saw fireworks? Anybody? No? How many of you had a fight with your wife and you had fireworks at home? No? Okay. Well, happy Fourth uh, weekend. Where, where, you had a fight with your wife? What? No. No. My dad bought a new car. You what? My dad got bought a new car. Praise God. I'll see. All right. Um, uh, we, uh, we, we celebrate uh, Independence Day. And I don't know about you, but to me, it's a, it's a, it's a big day. Uh, it's a big day because this is one of the few nations that still, and I don't know how much longer, but still we have the freedom to worship God. Uh, we could do it in the open. We could do it on the street corner. Uh, we could do it um, it, it, on our private property, our public property. Um, but that, that restriction is getting larger and larger. Um, and um, I, I see that happening all over in schools and, and, and places. And so it is, it is something to celebrate that we still have freedom in this, in this nation. So happy 4th of July. Uh, I just want to give you one quick announcement. It's a very important announcement. And it's very important announcement because there are a lot of us who are not here. Okay? Uh, and it just so happens that today is cleanup day for the English ministry. Okay? And so uh, if you all go home, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to be stuck doing it myself. And... Uh, uh, it'll be a quick job, I promise you. It'll be a, a, a what do you call it, a, a lick, a lick and a spit, or something like that. It's uh, it'd be it'd be real quick. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your faithfulness, and I want to say thank you to the ladies too for uh, for leading us in worship. Um, and uh, we have the the Chinese supreme, I guess, here. Um, but thank you for leading us in worship. We appreciate that. And on short notice, too. I think you got the notice maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, something like that. Yeah, so short notice. Thank you so much. Now, for the next couple of months, we're going to take a little break from Acts. We've been in Acts since the, the first of the year. But for the next couple months, we're, we're going to take a break from that. We'll, Lord willing, we'll pick back up in, in the middle of September. Uh, but for the month of July and August and part of September, we're going to be in Nehemiah, okay? Um, 
And uh, I think it's a, it's a, a, a great book for us to address uh, with all that's going on in, in our world today. It's no secret that our nation is in turmoil. If you think otherwise, you've been living under a rock. The America that you and I grew up in is no longer. Our value system that was once the norm lie in ruins. The family structure is destroyed. And I am, I, 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 I'm tempted not to say why, because I think it's going to open up a can of worms. But against better judgment, I'm going to say it anyway. Good. I think in part it started with the two income household. I think that that is in part anyway what is wrong with the family. Okay? Now, if you want to challenge me on that, you can do so uh, after the service. Okay? What was wrong is now right, and what was right is now wrong. The gospel has been watered down to mean nothing more than a set of principles to help you prosper. Or make you feel good about your sin. We are in trouble. Our nation is in trouble. And we are desperate in desperate need of a remnant of true believers to confess their sins and call upon the name of the Lord. I want you to ponder this question. Where do you think this church will be in 45 years? Where do you think it will be? Do you take for granted that it will be a vibrant and growing and maturing hub of disciple makers? I ask you this question because I, I don't believe for a second that it will happen automatically. If it's going to happen, if this is going to be a vibrant place where people are growing and discipling and maturing in their faith, it's going to have to be intentional. I want to show you this slide, if you could put that slide up of this map. Currently, there are 22 church properties in Los Angeles, in L.A. County, that are up for sale. If you go to West L.A., the, there's, there's a church in, in West, West Hollywood that used, it, well, it used to be a church, and now it's, it's a nightclub. For several years, I spent on the west side planting a church there, and I drove by this property. I'll show you this slide. Um, I drove by this property every day, and it, it was a church, and then a few years later, it was a Whole Foods market. But they left uh, the bell tower up there. Of course... Government likes that because retail commercial real estate generates a lot more tax revenue than a church property. And so they will jump at the chance to take what is deemed a religious uh, institution and turn it into a money-making uh, facility. A few years back, a man visited our church, and when I introduced myself to him, he had this sort of silly grin on his face, and I said, what's so funny? It's one of those, hey, you had to be there kind of moments, right? But I said, what's so funny? And he, he told me this. He goes, years ago, when I was in college, 
the house that was on this property was my fraternity. He goes, and now, now I'm coming here to worship God. And he just thought that that was the greatest thing in the world. That what the atrocities, the things that took place on this property at one time, now people are gathering on a weekly basis to honor God. So it's with that backdrop that I want to share today from Nehemiah just some insights on what does God want us to do. So would you pray with me and we'll get started. Father, we just want to pause now and give you thanks for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for this message and the words of Nehemiah. And I pray, Lord, that it will inspire us and not just make us feel good, but, Lord, that it will inspire us to action in some way. For some, it will be very small steps. For others, it will be giant steps. But I suppose every step will seem like a giant step to most of us. But we ask you, Lord, not just to inspire us with these words, this passage, but to direct us to action in our own individual lives and us as a church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God this property is now a church, but the reality is that it could very well become just another meaningless building or even a frat house again. That is, unless those of us who are here are intentional about our strategic planning now to ensure a vibrant and thriving ministry well beyond the next 45 years. Well, you say, why 45 years? Well, if you haven't been paying attention, we just celebrated 45 years. And, and so I'm looking to the next 45 years. I'm going to call it Vision 45. So if you hear me talk about Vision 45, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about asking God to give us a vision for what this church will be doing long after we're gone. Well, some of you will still be here, but most of us will be gone. 45 years from now, uh, I will be 110. <laughs> so, I'm just, I would just, I would be just old enough to become president. <laughs> vision 45. What vision does God have for us to make sure this church is still a kingdom-minded church long after we're gone? How do we do that? Well, we turn to Nehemiah for an example. Turn with me to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. Now, I just want to give you some background on Nehemiah. It, Nehemiah's day, uh, his, his time was about the same period uh, as Ezra. In fact, in the, in the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, there one, it's one book. Ezra and Nehemiah is one book. And a lot of the older, older writings in the Jewish writings, it's, it's also one book. Okay, so it took place roughly at the same time. Now, Ezra, uh, his focus was on spiritual matters. And so Ezra was the spiritual leader of God's people in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah was kind of the political, or he was the tactical leader. Leader. He was the organizer. He's the one that organized the rebuilding of the wall. Nehemiah's time was during the reign of King Artaxerxes the first. Now God's chosen people had been in captivity since 607 B.C. 
And in 538 BC, Cyrus II issued an order allowing some exiles to finally return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And it was completed in 515 BC, nearly 100 years after they were exiled. Ezra returned in 467 BC. Let me just show you that slide up there. Um, there's a typo up there, and I'll draw your attention to it. Oh, don't. There you go. Okay. So here you have, you see that line there uh, where it drops down. That is where, where it first drops. That's where they were taken into captivity in 607. Then the second arrow you see there is the temple being rebuilt, and then is a typo. It's actually year 445, but it says 454, where Nehemiah returns. Now, it just looks like a line to us. It looks like maybe a step or a cutaway of a swimming pool or something like that. But to the Jewish people, it was 162 years of exile. That, what that tells you is the, the people who were alive then that were in exile had never seen their homeland. They'd never been there. So Nehemiah returns... Uh, 445 B.C., 162 years later. Israel was scattered among the nations and longing for their homeland, the land that they had never seen, and that included Nehemiah. Now, when we hear about great heroes in the Bible, we sometimes we want to be like them. We wish that we could be like them. We wish we had their courage. We wish we had their insight and wisdom. We wish that we had their vision. But what if I were to tell you that all the resources and power they had are available to you? Well, you will find in the passage in the scriptures is that Nehemiah was really an ordinary person. Name me a person besides Jesus who did great things for God in the Bible who were great on their own. There's not a single person. Abraham tried to do things on his own. He took matters into his own hands. Moses had all kinds of excuses. David was a lowly shepherd boy. If you want to get down to it, he was the runt of the litter. He's the one that stayed home and took care of the sheep because his, and, and his older brothers went off to fight because they said he just... He just too frail, too weak. Peter had foot and mouth disease. Any of you had that disease before? Yes, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Nehemiah was just an ordinary man. But Nehemiah had a secret weapon. Do you know what that secret weapon was? Prayer. Prayer. When it, it comes to prayer, some of us always pray for the same thing when we pray. It's the same cycle, the same words over and over. In fact, it's kind of routine for us. We sit down, some of us, the only time we pray is when we sit down to eat. And we say the same prayer. And you do that three times a day and you go, oh, my prayer life is good. I pray three times a day. I've noticed in my own personal prayer life that the most distracted hour in the day is the hour of prayer. I go to sit down to pray and I suddenly have a million things to do. Or... I did those million things, and now I'm too tired to pray. It is an hour of distraction. To combat such distractions, I encourage you to commit to a time 
and a place for your daily prayer. Mark it in your calendar. Uh, program your smartphone. Let your smartphone work for you in that way. Set an appointment. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour. Make an appointment with yourself and God to spend time in prayer. It may help keep you focused if you use this acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. If you have a pencil, pen, uh, some of you are smiling, nodding your head, because you, you, you use that. You know what I'm talking about. Acts. Okay? The first is A, adoration. Give praise to God. Recognize Him as who He is. There is none like Him. And then confession. C, confession. It's important for us to confess our weaknesses, our sins, and our inability to do things on our own. And then T, thanksgiving. Thank God for the things that he has done. Well, you say, well, he hasn't done anything for me. Excuse me, are you breathing? If you're breathing, God's done something for you. And then supplication. That is, let your needs be known. Most of us, that's where we start. We just go right on in. You know, I, and I think, that, I think that grieves God. You know? It's like your kids that come to you and they just, they, the only time they want to talk to you is, is when they want something or they need something. But isn't it a wonderful thing when your kid comes in and he just, he or she, they just want to snuggle. They don't want anything. They just want to snuggle. I love that. Now, my kids are too old to snuggle with me, except my daughter. We still snuggle. But, you know, my, one of my sons, he's, you know, he's bigger than me, and I just can't imagine him sitting in my lap and snuggling. <laughs> But figuratively, it's just wonderful that your kids just want to be near you, not because they want anything or need anything. Now, let me just caution you. Don't be, don't be legalistic about it. And what I mean is don't, don't beat yourself up if you miss a day or two. You're, you're, it doesn't mean you're a bad Christian. You'll feel bad about it, and the devil will try to convince you that you never should have started in the first place, and then you'll give up altogether. You'll agree with him. So, yeah, you're right. And, and finally, I would say have a set place. Just somewhere. I mean, if you, got a, if you have an empty closet, and you say, well, I don't have an empty closet. Well, it, it may be because you have too much stuff. But just find a place. For me, it's, it's a dining room table. I get up early, and I sit at the dining room table. I go and make a cup of coffee, and I sit down with my Bible and my journal, and that's where I read, and that's where I pray, and that's where I write. Do I do it every single day? I want to. But there are days when I miss. And I, don't, I used to beat myself up. And feel guilty, and all, I don't anymore. I just say, thank you, Lord, for your grace. Now, the next time I come to your house, I'll be asking you to show me your pop place of prayer. Okay? Now, Carissa, that doesn't mean show me your pop, your dad. Say, Here's my pop. <laughs> no, I want a place where you pray. I want to see that place. Nehemiah receives devastating news that it just rips his heart open. And see what he does. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. It's page 714 in my Bible. Not that it would, that helps you in any way. If you got your Bibles there, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakla. 
Now it happened in the month of Keslev, that is November, December, in the 20th year, that's the reign of Artaxerxes I. As I, as I was in Susa, the citadel, Susa is a place, uh, it's, it was a summer palace uh, for the Persian, uh, Persian, sorry, <laughs> I just, I just blanked out here. Uh, I put my notes in wrong. I turned the page and it's blank. Lord help me. Okay. Well, Susa was, uh, was, is the summer citadel. I got a map of it. Let me show it to you where it is. You see that map there? There you go. Okay. Do you see Susa? It's, uh, it's just where it says Elam, Babylonia there, Elam. Right above that is Susa. It's, it was a summer place. It's a very significant place. Uh, it's where the Persians, Persian king, Persian kings sent, spent their summers. This is where all the, all, all, all the hubbub that you read in Esther took place right there. It's also where God gave Daniel his vision. Is right there at Susa. Okay, so a lot of God's people and God's work being done in a pagan kingdom's palace. Citadel. All right. Uh, <clears throat> verse 2. That Kanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard this, the, these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Let me ask you this question. What is your initial response to tragic news? What do you do when you hear tragic news? You're shocked. And maybe you weep like Nehemiah did. But then what do you do? You try to take matters into your own hands. This thought came to me yesterday when I was talking on the phone with a dear friend and he was asking me how Donna is doing and my response was I wish she was a car and what I mean by that is if she was a car I could figure out a way to fix her I would figure it out Some of you are that way. You're fix-it people. You want to fix things. And sometimes we go in and we try this and we try that and, and we make matters worse even, in some cases. What does God want us to do? He wants us to turn to Him. Young people, if you don't hear anything else today and you hear this and you take this and you learn from this and you, you take this the rest of your life, you, it would, you would be living a blessed life. And that is when tragedy strikes, when difficulty comes, turn to him first. Not much is written about Nehemiah's early life, but somehow, somewhere along the way, he learned to turn to the Lord in prayer. He was a slave after all. And what else could a slave do but to pray? Verse 5, And I said... O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, 
who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Here, Nehemiah begins with adoration. That's what we're talking about when we say adoration. He's recalling who God is. He's the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, and he keeps covenant with steadfast love for those who love him and keep his commandments. There, there are a million things that you could say about God. He is the one true God. He is a loving God. He is a promise-keeping God. He is a redeeming God. But Nehemiah's focus is on God's covenant with man. That God is a promise keeper. Why is this on his heart? Because he knows that the exile for the last 162 years is a direct result of Israel's collective disobedience. Their exile is a result of God's faithfulness. Why don't you hear that? He is faithful in doing what he says he is going to do. You read that in 2 Chronicles in the scripture reading. If you will keep my commandments, I will bless you. If you do not... I will withdraw my blessing. He told his people over and over again and gave them warnings after warnings. And then after a history of one wicked king after another and the people rebelling against God and disobeying him, God fulfilled his promise and he removed his blessings from their midst. He said, okay. That was the reason for the exile. It wasn't because God didn't love them. Some people have the idea that God loves them and won't let any harm come to them. But it's because God loves his people that he kicked them out. And I think Nehemiah understood that. Verse 6, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. He's not only confessing the sins of his people, but he is also confessing his own sins. It's easy for us to say, Lord, America has sinned and turned against you. That may be true, but at the core of confession is that we acknowledge our own shortcomings before anyone else's. We have to recognize that the downfall of America is partly because the church has been silent. Many churches have bought into being politically correct. And you, ha you hear this new term now called woke or wokeism. And many churches, in, in an effort to and, and, and they think that they're trying to display the love of God and they completely forgot that God is also just. Verse 7. Nehemiah is laying it all out. I mean, he's 
He's saying, We've, we have all sinned, including me and my father's household. We all played a part in this. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that are commanded, uh, uh, that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are faithful, I will, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, the word heaven doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that, that, that God's going to bring back the, the dead people from heaven back to, that's not, it, it simply means horizon, Okay. So it's, what he's giving you is a picture of these people that were in exile and they took, them, they took these people over the horizon where you can't see them anymore to a faraway land. That's the picture he's pre uh, presenting there. From there, I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. I want you to notice that Nehemiah comes to God on God's terms and not his own. He says, God, you re I remember you saying that if we return to you, that you will gather us back. Nehemiah is not saying, God, we did this bad thing. Now can you, can, can you fix it as we continue to do bad things? That's what a lot of people do. And Nehemiah knew that if he was going to return to God, if God's people were going to return to him, that they had to do it his way, not man's way. He recognizes that the reason for their calamity is because they got off track from God's will. And getting back on God's track is where... It all has to begin. That's a non-negotiable. We don't ask God to fix things while we continue to break things. It's true that whatever troubles you, Jesus is the answer. But it all begins with the word repent. Repent, this word, it, it, it has this meaning where you're going one way, it's the wrong way, it's away from God, it is your way, it's what you want to do. And to repent it is to make a one, 180 and go back the other way. It, you can't get any farther away from the way that you've been going. And you're walking back to where God is. By the way, you're going this way, you're going the wrong way. I'll tell you this. I, I can tell you this from experience. The moment you turn, the moment that you turn, and you think, I've been walking away from God for 40 years, 50 years, 10 years, 6 months, and it's going to take me that many years to get back to God. But the moment that you turn around, He's right there. He's right there. That's who God is. That's what awaits us. But it's got to start there. You can't just keep going and say, God, help me. you got to repent. you got to turn away from your sin, and you got to turn back to him.
You can't keep going in the same direction and expect God to change anything. Now comes supplication. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, I was a cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah is a slave. He can't go anywhere. He can't do anything without the king's approval. And he knows that if he's going to do something, if God is going to use him to do something, then he's got to go and he's got to talk to his boss. But before he does that, and before he makes a mess of it, he says, Lord, grant me success. Give me mercy on the side of my boss, King Artaxerxes I. We'll pick this up next week. We'll continue that, that he was a cupbearer, that he had to go talk to the king, get the king's approval. What's the lesson for us to learn here? If we don't get anything else today, It's the, price of, it's the price of admission right here. Before you do anything, pray. Repent. Stop going the way that you're going. Repent. Turn around. Focus on God. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And they say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then don't do anything until he tells you. <coughs> don't look at your watch. Time is running out. I got to do something now. You know, we get so caught up in that, don't we? In these commercials, it's like, you act now, you know, time is running out. And, you know, we're in the last day of the sale. And then the next week they have another sale that's even better. <laughs> But we get so caught up in that frenzy and we think something's got to happen now. Let me tell you something. God is no respecter of time. Time is our thing. To God, a thousand years is like a second. Today is uh, our turn to clean God's house. I hope we do a good job. It's his house. We usually do. But I wonder how often we think about cleaning God's house here. Are there things that need to be cleaned out? Are there things that you need to let go and let God? Are there things that you need to just put in God's hands? if we're going to prepare ourselves for God to do something big through us, 
and to prepare this church for the next 45 years, we need to start with the prayer of Nehemiah. A prayer of confession. If we're going to see this nation turn back to God, before we pray for God to straighten out other people, we ought to be praying for God to straighten us out. We're all broken. We all need Jesus. We all have things we need to let go and let God. Let us pray together. Father, thank you that you are patient with us. Thank you, Lord, that the moment that we repent and turn back to you, there you are, right in front of us. You're not sitting on some great throne that's unreachable, unobtainable, that we cannot approach. <coughs> but you are right there the moment that we re repent. God, open our spiritual eyes to see the things that that need to be thrown off, that need to be cleaned out, that need to be thrown away, given up, tossed aside, that we can run free this race that's marked out for us. Lord, I sometimes think about where this church might be in the next 45 years by then they, the people here will be celebrating the 90th year the 90th anniversary Lord give us the courage and the resources and the will to make sure that we do our part to ensure that this church will continue to be kingdom building, disciple making, life changing, the beacon of hope in this dying, oppressed world. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.